Hi there, I'm Kevin the Dark Ranger Poe, and if you're watching this video, it's probably because I've been invited to help you plan and organize your public stargazing event. Alternatively, maybe you're just watching this to look for some ideas you can incorporate into your events. Either way, it's a great opportunity for me to share some of the things we've discovered at a place that I work called Bryce Canyon National Park. Now, let me just say, this has got to be one of the best jobs in the world to be the head dark ranger at Bryce Canyon. I've got to do a lot of really exciting things. I've been hiking a couple times with astronaut Story Musgrave, the famous repairer of the Hubble Space Telescope. I actually had John Dobson sign my Dobson. How cool is that? I got to see an annular eclipse with astrophysicist Jana Levin. And I even had the opportunity to teach Brian Cox how to ride a horse while we were doing some work for a new series he calls The Human Universe, discussing deep time as we rode through the canyons of southern Utah. But I think the greatest honor comes from working with a group of night sky preservationists and talented telescope operators that are collectively known as the Dark Rangers. You know, Isaac Newton said that um, he stood on the shoulders of giants to gain his position in the world. And what I would like to say is that I have not much use for giants, but indeed I've rubbed shoulders with some excellent problem solvers. And so I ask you, is there really anything more valuable in the universe than a good problem solver? So to discuss the problems that uh, commonly occur at public stargazing events... We're going to play a little game that I call the Astronomer's Family Guy Feud. Now, this is normally a lot more fun when people come up out of the audience and they make a guess and we reveal whether they got it right or wrong. But we're just going to go kind of walk through it here in this little video. So let's see, what might you call out? Uh, people are always breaking my telescopes and eyepieces and stuff. <coughs> Yeah, apparently that's not really a problem. Now, at Bryce Canyon, over the last 15 years, we have made about 275,000 contacts, and not once has a single visitor broken a piece of astronomy equipment. My staff, on occasion, fortunately not very often has, but nobody from the public ever has. So that's a common concern, and really it's more of a myth. If you've had an experience where the public has broken some of your equipment, well, you definitely need to keep watching the rest of this video. But anyway, let's get back to our game. Um, okay, so they're always bumping into my telescope and, and knocking it out of alignment. Yeah, that definitely does happen. That's the number one complaint. Uh, one of the problems I have is folks always try to bait me into a political or a religious discussion. Yeah, those are kind of the no-nos, right? And sometimes you can find that occasional person, not very often, but uh, wants, to, wants to see if they can have that kind of a discussion with you. Yeah, man, the biggest problem is people are bringing in lights and, like, ruining my night vision, man. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely one. Um, light pollution can be a problem. Uh... I, I'm tired of repeating myself, you know? It's just so exhausting when when I, like, say the same thing over and over again for hours. Right, okay, well, that's definitely can be a problem, repeating yourself. All right, folks, you get the idea. We'll just kind of reveal these as we go. Uh, nobody understands or cares. And you ever have that thing where you do a nice long explanation and you just kind of get the crickets noise, you know, in the background because pretty much nobody seems to care? And we can help you with that, too. I spent the whole night on one object. Now, some of my staff think that's a great situation because they're so knowledgeable and skilled at communicating information, they're happy to spend all night talking about Saturn. But a lot of people want to uh, do a little bit more variety. They ask dumb or hard questions. Yeah, so dumb questions are the ones that I guess you would say that are kind of beneath you to have to answer, but the hard ones are the ones that kind of make you embarrassed because, yeah, well, maybe you should know the answer even if you don't. Over here we have number five. That's a problem, right? They expect something when it's cloudy. Now, is that really ridiculous? Is it impossible to do something when it's cloudy? Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Number three, they can't find the object of the eyepiece. Okay, yeah, that definitely happens fairly commonly, but obviously there's some solutions to that. And the second one is my line is too long or too short. Hmm, well, we're going to say a lot about that one before this video is over. Okay, thank you there, Peter. Now we'll move on to discuss some real solutions. 
One of the things we like to do at Bryce Canyon is to give folks a formal presentation before we send them out to the telescopes. And formal probably really isn't the right word because these are fun, amusing, multimedia PowerPoint presentations. And believe it or not, all of us dark rangers can carry an audience for about 60 minutes. But after 60 minutes, we might have 200 or if we have two venues going simultaneously, 400 people that are excited and ready to get out to those telescopes. But before we let them go, we give them a telescope etiquette talk. Sometimes this can just be a quick presentation presentation on the stage. Other times we just run this video clip from the Bryce Canyon website that gives people not only what they need to know before they go to the telescopes, but even why they might want to plan a vacation to Bryce Canyon, what they can expect by joining an astronomy show. So sit back, uh, take a couple minutes here, we'll listen and watch to some of the things you would include in a telescope etiquette talk that will make all the difference on the stargazing field. Though telescopes are durable when used correctly, they are surprisingly vulnerable to certain things and because they are also very expensive, there is no eating, drinking or smoking allowed in the stargazing area. Pets are also prohibited. Upon entering the stargazing area, don't bother rushing to get in line behind a telescope. As the old saying goes, he or she who views through the scopes first, views worst. Resist the urge to get in line for the largest telescope. For certain objects, telescope size matters. But also realize that in the time you spend waiting in one line, you could usually see three to four equally astonishing things at other smaller telescopes. While in line, listen for the background information the telescope operator is sharing with the rest of the line. Without an understanding of what you are about to see and why it's significant, one fuzzy gray object looks pretty much like the next. Once you're at a telescope, use the stepladder to reach the eyepiece and or to stabilize yourself. But don't touch the telescope. Not only might you bump it away from showing the object in question, even the slightest touch will cause the telescope to vibrate, leaving you with a blurry dancing image. If you can't see anything, don't panic. Just tell the telescope operator. There's a good chance the object is no longer in view. Leave all of your light sources behind. No flashlights, flash photography, or even astronomy smartphone apps are allowed. All these light sources instantly ruin our night vision. Finally, don't forget your jacket or sweater. It gets cold at night here at Bryce. 40 degrees Fahrenheit is possible even in August. Okay, so that's pretty easy, right? About two minutes can save you all kinds of time and trouble later on. You know, even if you're not doing formal presentations before you're stargazing with telescope session, and, and by the way, you should be, um, but, but if you're not, uh, you could also just take the same information and kind of corral people before you let them on the uh, stargazing field. You know, gather them up in groups of 10 or 20 as they arrive and, and give them a standard little message. Uh, it does make a big difference. And if you don't have time to develop your own, you're certainly welcome to use the video from Bryce Canyon. You can download it from their YouTube channel. Um, if you don't know how to do that, then contact me and I'll be happy to help you out. But let's just kind of review here what some of these complaints that we can address by just having a good telescope etiquette presentation. So we've got the don't bump a telescope problem pretty well solved right there. Uh, line is too long, too short. I'm taking care of that. Can't find the object in the eyepiece. Yes, this is definitely going to help them, giving them that little bit of information. And, of course, we address the issue of light pollution. And this brings us to solution number two. Pre-assign a class of objects based on the scope and operator's ability. And what we mean by a class of objects, there's kind of that list I've got there. There's galaxies, planets, binary stars, star births, star deaths, and clusters. And you could expand that. Some people might want to have open clusters and globular clusters. It really just kind of depends on how large of a team you have. But by doing this, it accomplishes a lot of important things dealing with those complaints. So let me just kind of walk through uh, how we would do this sort of thing at a place like Bryce Canyon. Okay, so there's all of our telescope operators, and then we just kind of divvy it up. And it's important to us to get the right scope for the right size job. So, for example, you know, Richard with uh, his 20-inch 
uh, Dobsonian there, he knows that uh, it's an excellent scope for galaxies, so he's going to take galaxies. He also knows that he can't start with a very faint galaxy while we're waiting for it to get full dark, so he might take on the cigar galaxy there, M82. But when he's get tired of looking at M82, he can just arbitrarily switch to the Whirlpool galaxy, uh, which I think is his personal favorite. And that way, he doesn't have to stare at the same thing all night long. He doesn't have to keep giving the same information. Now, Jeff over here with his um, gigantic 24-inch Dobsonian, uh, it would be good for galaxies, but he knows that Richard's got galaxies covered, so he's going to jump in and do star deaths. And in this case, he might start with the Ring Nebula, a nice planetary nebula there. Uh, and he might move on to the Cat's Eye, because he's got enough aperture. That's one of the things in the sky you can actually see some color uh, in, in the summer sky. Uh, his big scope gives an, an excellent view of that, and Jeff is exceptionally good at explaining to folks uh, the, the fascinating life cycle of stars and as they end and as a planetary nebulae okay so let's see who's next well we've got jim over here who's got a nice refractor which means he's going to start by showing people venus until venus sets and then he'll naturally switch to saturn as a second object uh kate and if that looks like a solar telescope she has actually it is but let's pretend it's another refractor she's going to take on binary stars like like albireal and she could do other special stars but at some point she might decide towards the end of the night to bring her scope around to show people the moon you know the last object would just ruin your night vision i guess uh, you might might as well make that the moon. And then Chad over here says he's going to help with planets because he knows that everybody loves looking at planets. So he might start with Jupiter while Jim is doing uh, Venus. And then he could switch to some deep object like uh, Neptune. Um, actually, I think that one might be Uranus there in the picture. Okay, so this leaves Joel with his medium-sized Dobsonian, and Joel says, eh, we need more help with the galaxies. So he's going to use a little bit easier galaxies for smaller aperture telescopes. There's Andromeda, and his second object might be the Sombrero Galaxy. And what's left is uh, Angie and myself, and since we have 11-inch SCTs, you know, it's a pretty versatile scope. We just kind of fill in the gaps. Angie notices right away that there's nobody doing star births, uh, you know, emission nebulae, um, or stellar nurseries, as they're often called. So so she might start with, uh, I believe that's the Trifid there, and then kind of make her way on to the Swan Nebula. And I myself, I'm happy to take whatever's left, and it just so happens that on this particular night as we were planning, I would get clusters. And I love clusters, so I might start with a globular cluster, M13, uh, though I actually like five a little bit better. And then to really please the crowd, I'm going to show them what I call the owl cluster. Sometimes people call it ET, but in dark sky with a good telescope, you can see that there's actually talent talons down there on the feet of that creature and of course et didn't have talons what else could it be but a great horned owl about ready to drop out of the sky and attack um the neighbor's house cat oh okay well a skunk right everybody doesn't like skunks anyway so that's what we would do is assign our objects and all that's left is to assign our positions on the field but let's just kind of work through our checklist here we addressed many of these with our telescope etiquette presentation and now because we have pre-assigned a class of objects for each operator we're not going to be in that situation of repeating ourselves People might be asking harder, dumb questions, and you know what? We can deflect them. If somebody asks a question about galaxies that I don't know, I can say, hey, that guy with the great big telescope there is a galaxy expert. Go over and ask Mr. Richard your dumb or hard question. And, you know, it's okay to do that kind of stuff. We, we trade back and forth with each other all night long. And also now we don't have to uh, spend the whole night on... Okay, so now that we've pre-planned exactly what everybody's going to do, the next thing we have to do is organize ourselves on our stargazing field in such a manner as makes sense. So solution number three, organize telescope field with two rows and a central aisle that is lit. We like to use uh, little solar-powered walkway lights because this really helps people find their way around and also find their way back to their cars or wherever they started from the night before. A lot of times we like to put the big telescopes uh, kind of at the far end of the field to sort of draw people towards them. So in this case, we've got our big dobs aligned that way. But we're also doing something else here. Maybe you've noticed, if you look down there uh, at Angie, she's talking about star births. I'm talking about star clusters, you know, which you can kind of think of like maybe teenage years of stars. And then finally, Jeff is doing star deaths. So we're telling a more complete story than just showing people, you know, one fuzzy gray object after the next. And naturally, Angie, after they say, oh, thanks for the view, she's going to send people to me. She's not going to tell them, uh, why don't you go over and look at the planets now? They can look at the planets all night long. But to kind of help that uh, mental uh, comprehension, uh, you build a story uh, from one telescope to the next. 
Okay, so and then of course we can see here as we talked about, we've got um, Chad starting out with Jupiter, um, Jim starting with Venus, and as they switch to the second objects, then imagine with just you know eight telescope operators how folks are going to get to see 15, 16 different things and really walk away from a wonderful experience. So as we go back through our checklist here, um, we took care of quite a bit with telescope etiquette in green, our uh, pre-assignment of object classes in orange, and now what we're adding to the system is we're getting away from this thing of people not caring about what they're being presented because we're, we're organizing ourselves. We can better tell stories. And also we're once again addressing the line is too long or too short. Because, of course, we're going to be heads up. You know, if we see that everybody is congregating at Jeff's gigantic telescope, um, that's fine to start the story of stars from death. But Angie might walk over and say, hey, folks, you're kind of in a long line here. My line's kind of short. Jeff's going to tell you about how stars die, but I'm going to tell you about something more positive, how stars are born. And doing that sort of thing, sort of thing she's going to pull a bunch of people out of Jeff's line. It's just a way of kind of distributing the crowd uh, and, and very effective when you make the extra effort to organize yourself. Ah, solution four. Manage how much you say in research with the iceberg rule. The iceberg rule was invented, or so the legend says, by some really smart interpreter decades and decades ago. But basically, it's an analogy that kind of guides you in how you conduct yourself in any situation, really, when you're communicating information to somebody, or especially to audiences. So you can imagine, you know, these great big icebergs, like in the North Atlantic, there's a certain amount that floats above the waterline, and it's supposed to be about 10%, I guess. But that's the bit people see above the water. And then there's the huge, massive lurking amount that is below the waterline, just waiting to, you know, sink the Titanic or whether other ship uh, blunders too close. Now, you can use the same information for describing how you communicate information. So even if you know everything there is to know about something unique like maybe pulsars, you only communicate your best 10% because your best 10% is going to be what actually is interesting to uh, people who are not as excited about pulsars as you may happen to be. So you can also think of this in terms of you know, communication and the pie chart there. I have all this information, all this knowledge, and I only communicate 10%. When I first started doing astronomy, uh, and, and by the way, I didn't come to this naturally. I never had a single college class. I started a college class in astronomy, but at the time, uh, Utah State University was using their Astronomy 101 kind of as a weed-out course so they could find the truly great minds that would continue with NASA contracts. And anyway, that wasn't me. So I dropped it, and I switched to uh, geology. And geology got me to Bryce Canyon, and then looking up at the stars overhead, it occurred to me not knowing something about the universe, since we have one of the best views from this planet available uh, is really not doing my job entirely. So I, I've been playing catch up ever since. But when I first started doing astronomy presentations, I knew a couple of constellations and that was pretty much it. And once somebody asked me a question that was off my script, I was awful. And I explained it away saying, oh yeah, well, we don't really have time to talk about that right now. But, uh, you know, if you want to, after later at the telescopes, you know, I try to hide from that person. Uh, so they wouldn't ask me a question. I didn't know the answer. Here, the iceberg rule told me, you need to know a lot more information because I found out what I was doing is I was presenting like 100% of what I knew. And it wasn't very much. Have enough research knowledge on all the different subjects of astronomy. Because let's face it, if it's your hobby, you can always find time for your hobby. So that when somebody asks you a question, you have that extra depth uh, to go the distance. So here's our a list of complaints again. Once again, uh, green was telescope etiquette. We took care of that. Uh, orange was in uh, pre-planning. Red was how you organize a stargazing field. And here we can pick up a few more. Constantly repeating myself. Well, you know, if you have more information than just uh, uh, you're looking at NGC 457, it's a star cluster 10,000 light years away, you know, and then saying that over and over again, um, that's not as much as if you had more information you could share. You can use the analogies, and it looks like a great horned owl, and then you could talk about great horned owls, or you could talk about E.T. and say, wasn't that a great movie? Uh, some people say it looks like an F-18 or whatever um, military jet would have uh, twin engines in the afterburner. Okay, so people then with these, uh, you know, dumb, hard questions, if you have that information, you're going to be able to deal with those. And then, of course, we're also once again addressing this nobody understands, nobody cares, because you're not telling them everything you know, which is going to include a lot of boring stuff. You're telling them the best 10%. 
So here's an example of how the iceberg rule can be very helpful. As you can probably tell, I love astronomy, and over the years I've learned quite a bit, um, in part from standing on the shoulders of giants, but more uh, just rubbing shoulders with very learned people as part of our uh, Dark Ranger group. And I have to gauge myself. Uh, one of the uh, presentations I'm quite proud of is the one I call There's Only 42 Things in the Universe. Uh, because once you exclude planet Earth, you can quite literally only find 42 things in the universe. And I'm always saying this to, uh, you know, park ranger types or just anybody who's looking to get into astronomy but intimidated uh, by how hard of a science it is. And I always say, oh, that's ridiculous. There's only 42 things in the universe. You probably know 42 different bird species, 42 different wildflower species. It's not too hard to take on astronomy. And of course, the math can be uh, daunting. It was beyond my ability in college. But for the kinds of things we do uh, with the general public, yeah, you can you can get it pretty well captured in 42 things. Well, people know this about me. People might say, as happened right here, um, hey, aren't you the guy that does the 42 things? And I would say, yes, I am. And I'd ravel them off. You know, there's gravity and a strong nuclear force, electromagnetic, weak nuclear, strings and brains, bosons, quarks, leptons, cosmic background radiation, spiral galaxies, lifter, regular uh, molecular clouds, globular star clusters, blah, 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 just rattling off all this kind of stuff, which is ridiculous. And at that point, you know, the guy is probably thinking, boy, I'm sorry I asked. Um, when really what I could say is, yeah, you know, there are 42 things in the universe and they're all amazing. But you know what my absolute favorite is? Supernovas. And if I happen to be looking at the Crab Nebula, as I think I probably am on this winter night, then it would make all the sense to limit myself to just this 10% of my knowledge. And in fact, I'm not even going to give him the the 100% of my supernova knowledge. I'm once again just going to give him uh, 10% of, of 10%. So I could go into talking about degenerate matter, which I love talking about, and how the supernova implosion is actually a bounce where, you know, the atomic internal structure has been crushed and the electrons come right down and bond with the protons and then your neutrons and neutrons are dead as anything can possibly be dead, blah, 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 blah. But instead I might just start with, yeah, supernovas are the most horrific explosions imaginable, but one of the byproducts of them are the heavy elements on the periodic table. So quite literally, if it wasn't for supernovas, we wouldn't have all the modern technology that we need. And I would take a break. I would stop talking. Because if the guy didn't follow up with another question or a comment of his own, I would know that's all the information he needed. But if he said, yeah, I heard something about degenerate matter, then oh boy, now I get to unload that stuff. This is kind of how you pace yourself. Uh, once again, using this iceberg rule very effectively uh, to make sure you're providing the visitor with what they want and not just meeting your need uh, to vomit out all the information you have to share, whether anybody wants to hear it or not. And this is solution number five, the granddaddy of them all. It says improve everything you do by adopting the Dark Ranger Ratio. Well, what is the Dark Ranger Ratio? The Dark Ranger Ratio is the amount of time, energy, and attention you divide between two functions of your job as a public telescope operator. Number one, of course, is the line. And what we highly recommend is that you give 70% of your attention to the line. Not the person standing at the front of the line, which is where your telescope is, but the entire line. So that leaves only 30% of your attention at the scope. And this freaks out a lot of amateur astronomers. Oh, no, they'll knock over my telescope. They'll steal my eyepiece. They'll blah, blah, blah. And you can imagine all kinds of, of scenarios. And maybe you heard from that one guy's cousin, sister, and brother's roommate about that one time. Well, once again, we've had 275, almost 300,000 contacts in the 15 years I'm at Bryce Canyon. And we've never had a visitor accidentally, maliciously, or otherwise damage any of our telescope technology. This actually works. So let me just see if I can explain how great it is. What the Dark Ranger Ratio does by 70% of your attention aligned and 30% of the scope is it allows you to prepare your audience for their scope experience. This can, first and foremost, be here's how you hold the telescope, which of course you don't, but you climb onto the ladder of the step stool and you hold on to that. And here's how you hold your eye over the top of the eyepiece. And here's how you move your eyes in circles until you find the light. You know, you can do that to a line and that way everybody's going to pay attention. And if the people at the back of the line have heard that information twice or three times before they get to the telescope, so much the better. So, telescope's going to get bumped a lot less, believe it or not, than if you're standing right there at the telescope. You just have to trust us. You just have to try this because it is counterintuitive, but it is also super effective.
deals with the line being too long or too short. Now, how does that change? Well, actually, it usually will make your line longer. Even if you have a smaller telescope, and I take a lot of pride in being the smallest telescope on the field, yet trying to have the longest line. It's a little game I play with my colleagues, because if I'm talking to my line, I'm an interesting person. I'm somebody that's fun to stand and, and listen to, and they're happy to wait if it's even just for a small telescope. We already talked about that. If you can give me information how the, to get their eye in the right place, how holding on to the top of a step stool will help them hold their head still, and uh, how they're never going to realize what a bobble-headed person they were until they actually try to look through an eyepiece. All that kind of stuff is fun information that helps prepare them. We can also talk about the lights. Somebody switches on their astronomy apps. Hey, those are really great, but I'm going to ask you uh, not to be looking at it in line just for, you know, out of respect for others. But if you wanted to go over there and stand in that dark corner and practice your own constellation finding with your app, you're certainly welcome to. When you're done with that, come on back and get back in line. Uh, when expect something once it's cloudy, yes, here's your cloudy night solution. Because if you're talking to a line, especially if you're waiting for sucker holes to open up, you could tell them about the telescope. You could ask them questions about their visit. You could ask them questions about their background. You could ask if there's any people who own telescopes already in line, if they like their telescope, if they have troubles with it. There's plenty of information you can talk about once you get used to the dark ranger ratio. Repeating myself, yeah, that's to a certain extent you need to. You know, as you see your line bringing in new people, you're being heads up. Heads up's the key. When you're heads up, you're paying attention to your line because 70% is at the line. And you can realize, here's some new people, and I need to start over with my message, especially the one that helps protect my telescope. Uh, hard, dumb questions, yeah, that's going to happen. But again, you're going to be prepared for it because you can talk for the whole group. You're not going to have somebody ask the same dumb question three times. Um, can you show me which one is the universe? Um, or... Um, uh, how many uh, galaxies are in the solar system? You know, those kinds of things. You only have to do that once or twice when you're talking to the whole line. But if you're just talking to the person at the telescope, you might be doing it over and over again. One uh, spent the whole night in one object. Here, if that is the situation, if for some reason in your pre-assignment you were stuck with one object, um, it's not going to seem as miserable because you're going to have plenty of interaction with people. You're going to meet new people. You're going to be more than just some sort of robot. You know, the analogy we often use is like a flight attendant. Um, can you ever get off an airplane? You know, there's like 150 people in front of you, and they're just trying to get you off the airplane. And you can tell their material is usually not very deep. You know, oh, thanks for flying with us. Uh, thanks for choosing Delta or whatever it is. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye bye. And basically, that's all you're ever going to do if you're standing right there at a telescope because you only have a few seconds to talk to somebody. So you're going to tell them the same thing over and over again. This is the Hercules Globular Cluster, M13. Actually, that'd be pretty good. A lot of times I just hear, you're looking at M13? Next. You're looking at M13? Next. And that doesn't help them, and it's certainly not fun for you especially because it addresses this issue of nobody cares. What is the Hercules Globular Star Cluster? What does it look like? Use your imagination. Have some fun with it. I often say it's like a tiny bunch of diamonds, little tiny diamonds poured onto black velvet. And I don't really know if women in the audience go, ooh, or not, but I kind of like to imagine they are. So then after that's happened, and I've got maybe some husbands and boyfriends thinking, hey, thanks a lot, jerk. you got my wife all excited about diamonds. Then I say something fun like, but I have no idea what a pile of tiny diamonds looks like. Uh, that's definitely not in my tax bracket. So what I often refer to it as some salt grains on black construction paper. And pretty much I get everybody laughing at that point. Now, sometimes when you're addressing a line, other people in the line are going to want to play too. And sometimes when people have something to share, it's usually of a political or a religious nature. Does the Dark Ranger ratio work to solve this? Not exactly, and I can tell you how, but that's a whole other presentation. So here's an example of using Dark Ranger Ratio. Here we have Dark Ranger Angie Richmond. If she's standing in the normal position right by her telescope, then she can point up in the sky. Uh, we're looking at the Crab Nebula, and there it is, you know, with the green laser. And here it is in the eyepiece. Um, well, of course, there's nothing to see uh, with the naked eye for the Crab Nebula, so she's just pointing a laser into the sky. But look what would happen if we just kind of pushed Angie, uh, see, get over there. So now the whole line feels like she's not just talking to the person in the eyepiece. It's not a private conversation anymore. It's a conversation everybody can participate in. So when she puts her laser up in the sky and says, this is the Crab Nebula, then she can keep going. She can say, when you get to the eyepiece, it's going to look kind of like a fuzzy cloud. But if you stay with it long enough, if you relax your eyes, if you use your averted vision, and she could explain what averted vision is. And if it's a long line, she could have them hold their thumb up in the air and do the thing where you alternate closing one eye to figure out what their dominant eye is. All kinds of great information that's going to be preparing people for their view. 
But at that point, she might say, look for kind of some spidery, webby structure inside. These are the shock waves, uh, shock waves where the, the surrounding random hydrogen um, is being pushed like uh, so much snow in front of a, a snow plow um, as, as the energy expands throughout that section of the, of the galaxy. All kinds of good stuff that she can't do for one person at the telescope because there's not enough time. But when she's talking to the group using the dark ranger ratio, she's super effective and her line's going to get longer. But this time a long line is going to feel really good. Feel like you're accomplishing something and uh, providing the public with even a greater expectation than they had to start out with. Now, a lot of these ideas, especially the uh, dark ranger ratio, take a lot of time to get used to. But it's very important. You know, we get people from all over the world coming to Bryce Canyon from all walks of life, whether they're um, first-year college students or postdoctorate work or uh, professional interpreters that just want to add the knowledge of astronomy uh, to their toolkit. And they always, every single one, has a hard time with this idea of 70% of the line and only 30% of the telescope. That's crazy. But we eventually win them over. And it can take practice, but we're going to save you some trouble so you don't just have to practice. Here's some essentials that make the practicing all the easier and all the more effective. And eventually it'll just become automatic. It'll be second nature for you to do this. So the first thing is to keep your interpretation, the information you're going to share with people, you know, compartmentalized in, in small chunks because your first and foremost responsibility is to make sure people are seeing things in the eyepiece but really that only takes about 30 percent of your time just make sure people know that they're fully aware that they can interrupt you they are empowered at any point to say hey ranger i can't see anything in the eyepiece or whatever the situation might be and then you just excuse yourself oh folks i'll be right back let me help this person oh there you are okay oh that's great i see it now okay you're very welcome now let's see where was i oh yes we were talking about sexism in the sky this is one of the things I like to do. So imagine I'm showing people the Needle Galaxy, this amazing edge-on spiral galaxy. It's probably my favorite in the visible universe, and I think maybe even one of the largest spiral galaxies in the visible universe. Well, it's in Coma Bernices. And uh, so I might say, you know, Coma Bernices is a constellation about a woman's hair. And this might not surprise you, but there are a lot more constellations named for men up there than there are for women. Long pause. Full stop. I just stop talking. And I count 11 seconds, which is super uncomfortable. I'm not going to do it right now because it'll probably freak me out and, and probably freak you out. Three, four, five. Six. Can you imagine how long it'd be to go to 11? That's insane. Well, almost every time before I get to 11, there's going to be some comment. Oh, that figures. There's sexism everywhere. Well, of course. It's only men that have all this free time. They can stand around stargazing. All kinds of great comments. People are going to laugh. It gives you the, the realization that people are interested in the rest of the story. And especially for the other people standing in line who might not have wanted to bite once they see that a few people uh, and standing next to them are interested, they're going to join in and, and learning what you have to to say. And then so the next part of my story, I might list the constellations for men, I might list the constellations for women. And I can say that constellations, you know, have this purpose of, of uh, telling stories, but uh, uh, that, you know, that kind of have morals and virtues and, and things in them. But there is one true story in the sky. And that's when I explain the story of Coma Bernices and how the, uh, the Pharaoh Queen's uh, hair was suddenly removed from her head. She work, woke up one morning completely sheared. And of course, uh, since pharaohs are demigods, that was a big political problem. If it meant somebody could steal their hair, then who knows? Maybe they would stop building these big, gigantic pyramids and all the peasants would revolt. So the uh, the wise people got together there and uh, they decided they could help the queen by saying that the god Amun-Ra found that the queen's hair was so beautiful that he had to have it closer. So he snuck into her bedroom chamber and he, being a powerful god, had the right and ability to remove the hair from our, our demigod queen and he put it up in the sky and there's that constant constellation right there and that's coma bernices so that's a fun story and then i can't help but add of course all the you know farmers way out from the uh the uh, firelights of the uh of the nile uh, kingdom would look up in the sky and go yeah well, we've been seeing that since we were kids and uh, of course not be fooled Anyway, those are the ways that you can really keep that uh, dark ranger ratio going is by having some information compartmentalized chunks that you can share with people 
And then, of course, um, you can do that line management. You know, uh, hey, uh, this is a nice long line. There must be a really fun scope here. You know, of course, you'd be talking about yourself, complimenting yourself. It's a little bit shameless, but people usually laugh along politely. However, we all need to pivot just so we don't get mixed up with that other line over there where all they're doing is talking about boring stuff. And then you say something cool, boring stuff like exploding stars. You know, that's the kind of thing that makes that line management important because people say, hey, here's somebody who's concerned about me and I'm willing to help them help me get the most out of my experience. And, you know, one of the things that always comes up with these rules, and we already talked about this, this is the amateur telescope operator's biggest fear. They're going to break the equipment. Well, by using friendly ways of explaining the rules, you're so much better off. You know, don't say, don't touch the telescope. Um, you'll break it. That's not positive. Say, if you touch the telescope, you can't hold your hand still enough that you don't communicate vibrations to the tube, causing the object in the tube to bounce around the eyepiece. And then the only thing you can do at that point is grab your head. And even in the dark, this works if you have the right amount of theatrics. So I grab my head and shake your head, and I'm shaking my head now, at exactly the same frequency you're shaking the telescope. And everybody laughs, and everybody gets the message. Uh, they're not supposed to touch the telescopes. Much more friendly than just saying, no, don't, all night long. And so here's just a few more lines, uh, so to speak, for entertaining and educating your telescope line. Some ideas. And these are just to kind of get you started. I'm sure you'll come up with your own, and they would vary from different classes of objects you might be working with. But here's a good one. It looks like. And then describe what it looks like. I already did the tiny, tiny diamonds on black velvet one for a globular cluster. It reminds me of, and then you can relate something else. You know, when I'm talking about a binary star, I can say if you lived on a planet like this, uh, you would have the Anakin Skywalker experience. And then some people in the audience, knowing Star Wars, are going to go, oh, yeah, it has two suns. And suddenly, you know, a binary star for that Star Wars freak um, is something a little bit more interesting than just saying it's two stars. You could ask people, what would it be like to live on a planet with two suns? Would you want to have them together or would you want to have them up opposite each other so that it's always sunny? You know, just get people thinking the, the kind of imagination that should be inspired underneath a beautiful night sky. Probably the same thing that got you interested in this hobby and decided to drop some serious coin to get a good telescope. Um, you know, invite people uh, to do that same thing, to have, to have that same experience, that same process. A little bit of imagination is a great thing. And, of course, when you can make it relate to pop culture issues, it's going to be easier for more people to join in. And then, of course, what you're looking at, you know, maybe you're looking at an exploded star and it happens to be in the uh, constellation Lyra. Well, you could expand upon that and talk a little bit of cultural history. Not everybody just loves the physical science and the physics. There's some people are standing in line because, you know, their husband made them come and they have to because he said he would not take her out on vacation again if she sat in the car. You know, whatever that situation is, there's always these dynamics um, in, with couples and families. So when you can add both, when you add a little bit of history with all of your physical science, it might be that the historians in the audience and hearing those stories will suddenly get a lot more enthused about what's going on around them. But, you know, for those nerd geeks, boy, those nerd geeks, they love numbers, don't they? So you can do this kind of thing. You can say this object is however many million light years away. And I think for the Needle Galaxy, it's like 65 million light years away. It's one of the most distant objects we can see with a regular portable telescope. And so what's 65 million years ago? But the asteroid came down and wiped out the dinosaurs. You know, you can say the light left that galaxy before the asteroid hit us. And that gives them an idea about how big big is. And don't just stop at big. Also, mention something about the emptiness of the universe. Yeah, these numbers vary a bit from, uh, you know, expert to expert. But if you start with the interplanetary medium, you know, the stuff between planets, it's usually about five hydrogen atoms um, per, uh, you know, a cubic centimeter. Um, the interstellar medium, after you've left out into the Oort cloud, empty space before we reach out to Alpha Centauri or, you know, whatever the direction you're headed, the next closest star, then you might have um, about half a hydrogen item for every uh, square centimeter um, or when you get out to the intergalactic medium you know that the distance to that needle galaxy when there is absolutely nothing but nothing you know one hydrogen atom per cubic meter um, that's nothing. And then, of course, if you want to go on from there, if people are still interested, you stop, you do the full check, uh, you wait, uh, you use that question and enticer, enticer something like, and of course, this is very relevant for space travel. Stop talking, and somebody's going to say, why? Or somebody's going to say, oh, yeah, because if you don't have hydrogen, what are you going to get for fuel? And you can really have a lively discussion for those people that are waiting for their turn to you know, see uh, the Ring Nebula. 
And so finally, we come to the Dark Ranger's favorite pet peeves. And so these are the things that we would just really, really appreciate you not doing, especially when we're there, but even when we're not, because we know that these are non-helpful behaviors uh, to get into. So Jeff Goins goes first with, Thou shalt not speak in Messier or NGC. Uh, what he means is, if you're going to throw down your knowledge of NGC, that's NGC 4565, um, then also tell people the common name. It's the uh, Needle Galaxy. And then you follow up with something, you know. It looks like somebody took a knife and scratched my eyepiece because it's an edge on spiral. And those billions upon billions of stars are all lined up on this tight swirling disk. And that's why we see just a line in the sky. You know, do more. You can say the numbers if you need to, but do more than just throw down your Messier NGC knowledge. Don't forsake your line for fun questions requiring complex answers. I can't tell you how many times Angie Richmond had to counsel me on this because I've got my own little TOE, you know, a theory of everything. And boy, if somebody says something about dark energy or dark matter, I'm like, whoa, it's like everybody else on the field left and it's just me and this guy and I have to throw down all my musings to him. No. If they want to talk about that, say, hey, you know, we're going to be tearing down the telescopes here in about an hour. And when I'm putting stuff away, if you want to talk about that, would be great. But that's, you know, kind of beyond uh, most folks' uh, interest level right now. Eh, something polite. It's not a star party. Instead, call it public stargazing with telescopes. And the reason why Chad feels so strongly about this is we want to change the amateur astronomer's um, approach just a little bit. You know, you go to a Texas star party, or one of my favorites, the Oregon star party, and it's a lot of like-minded individuals. You don't need to do all the simple, mundane things, but for these public stargazing events, you've got to shift your mindset. Um, this isn't for you to uh, be able to see how many of the Messier objects you can find in one night. This is for them, the visitors, uh, to get them excited. And it takes more time and it takes more effort on your part, but that's why it's called public stargazing. Manage your line. Engaged lines are straight and focused. Meandering and murmuring lines are confused, impatient, and neglected lines. And it's easy to tell the difference, says Joel. And you know what? He's exactly right. When I supervise a stargazing session, that's all I have to do is look at the lines. And a lot of times it's the fellow with the great big old telescope that's got this big, long, uh, meandering line. And folks are chit-chatting in line. Some people are confused. They stand in line for a while, and then they get out of line. Um, you know, we want people to, to have a good time. But at a certain point, we need to keep them focused. So talking to your line, using that dark ranger ratio, that makes all the difference. And then you don't have to worry about lines running into lines lines and people feeling crowded and people being confused. Um, that goes back to that organizing your stargazing field with the central aisle that's lit. Um, then you make your lines go to the outside. Your lines don't go into the middle because that's a central aisle. That's where people are trying to move from one line to the next. Make your lines point outward. Where's your step stool? Even SETs need step stools with handles. It's not just about getting to the eyepiece. Give them something to hold on to besides your scope says Richard, and he couldn't be more right. Most of us can't remember the one time that Richard was wrong, but on this issue, he is 100% right. A cheap little step stool costs $20. There's not a piece of astronomy equipment in your collection that's less expensive than a step stool. However, there's probably not a piece in your uh, collection except maybe the telescope that's as important for a public stargazing event for people to be able to have a good experience. They need something to hold on to to be able to hold their head still. They're not used to that. Think back to your first time through a telescope, you or neither. And it wouldn't have been great if somebody had a step tool for you to use. Announce your objects. If I don't know what you're looking at, I can't pick objects that help tell a larger story, like stellar evolution, for example. See, this is me always thinking like an interpreter. What more can we get out of what we're doing right now? And so if I know that your second object is going to be uh, the Dumbbell Nebula, then what I might choose is the Mini Dumbbell Nebula. And that way I can say, hey, folks, what I'm showing you is a much further away version of what that guy has over there. But this one is edge-on, so you can actually see the spiral grass shape because on these planetary nebulas, they're often called, when they explode, the magnetic field channels the explosion, so it's not like a firecracker, but goes out in the shape of an hourglass, blah, blah, blah. And when you get over there to that guy's telescope, you're going to see the hourglass as if you were looking down on top of it when it was sitting on a table. You're basically looking down the barrel of the explosion. And whenever I say barrel of the explosion, you know the people in my line are going to be a lot more excited to be in your line than if I hadn't said that before.
Well, in these last 45 minutes, we've given you a lot of information to think about. So on behalf of the Dark Rangers of Bryce Canyon, past, present, and future, thanks for taking 45 minutes out of your day for exploring some ideas that might be able to make your public stargazing all the more effective. Keep all these things in mind. Practice. Contact me if you want more information. If you have other ideas that we can steal from you, we're always happy to do that too. But first and foremost, have a wonderful time doing it. You know, astronomy is an amazing hobby. And I just would like to remind you, the purpose of this presentation and a lot of what I do, is it's also an exceptionally good way of increasing science literacy teaching the scientific method, all those kinds of values that, from my humble opinion, society really can benefit from. So make the extra effort and see what kinds of advice you can incorporate. Maybe someday you'll even be comfortable with the Dark Ranger ratio. My name is Kevin the Dark Ranger Poe, and I wish you clear skies. <laughs>